Hi everyone, I'm Ian Cutters from Anantech, and you're joining me at the end of day one of Hot Chips. Well, it's called day one, technically day two. Yesterday was a bunch of tutorials, but today was the first proper day of talks, and I've just finished. I'm back in my hotel room. Uh, very busy day, lots of content has gone out, and I just want to just do a roundup of um, what today was and what we saw. Um, so let's head on over to Anantech. Now, if you weren't particularly interested, in hot chips, then you had all of this NVIDIA announces some new GPU or something or whatever. Um, Nate was there with Ryan helping. Um, but the first big talk of hot chips was actually the first one of the day. And uh, Andre got pre briefed on this. This is a deep dive into Samsung's Exynos M3 CPU architecture. Now, this is what is in uh, the latest Samsung smartphones. And I sat through this talk, um, just detailing how much better the M3 is versus uh, previous generations. Uh, this one's called Meerkat, and we've got uh, complete images of uh, microarchitecture, you know, overview of the back end and the front end, and how it changes versus M2. Now, Andre's um, gone through essentially every slide that they presented, giving him his own details. Uh, so, best to go read what he has to say about these. Um, you know, I love Andre's work, and this is going to be, if for anybody who's interested in um, architect, the microarchitecture design, um, this is something to read. Interestingly, they compare some things, you know, against their M1 core and M2 core. Um, ultimately, you know, there's cache hierarchy. Um, Ultimately, it comes down to um, performance figures. And we've got some physical layout representations here um, and uh, floor plans. Uh, they do say the M3 cores are twice as big as the previous generation, so that's all fun. Now, performance, they said the M3 in a range of tests, this is just um, an ordered, a uh, range of tests ordered in performance uh, comparison. Um, they're seeing you know, IPC difference between M2 and M3 here. And obviously um, the biggest, uh, the best benchmark that Samsung liked to um, push out was Geekbench 4 um, back in the review. And you know, lots of improvements all over, all over the, um, every Geekbench 4 test. However, if you remember when we did our own testing, uh, we found some real world issues which aren't represented by Geekbench. And then also Andre went into prove into um the kernel for the Exynos 9810 uh, in the Samsung Galaxy S9 and S9 Plus and you know just to show how we can get some additional battery life as well. Um, so that's an interesting uh th thing to read through. That's on the front page of an Antec. Um, just make your way through the NVIDIA stuff and it's there. Uh, we also posted this article um, about Intel or hot chips showing Cascade Lake. That's actually a talk for tomorrow, um, which we uh, they've given out all the slides for all the talks already. Plus, we got that um, those slides a couple of days early. Though, so I'm going to talk about that in tomorrow's roundup. But it's there if you want to read it now. Um, but what I did for most of today is um, I did plenty of live blogs. And so welcome to Hot Chips. And normally when we go to events, they have you know nice um, logos we can take photos of for our front image. But because this is just a bunch of talks at conference, we don't really get that. So the first one was um, Google Pixel Visual Core. This is the small SOC that's inside um, the Pixel 2 smartphones that's meant to improve the camera. Um, so yeah, this is how busy it was at Hot Chips. I've never seen this many people at Hot Chips. It's becoming a very um, be well attended conference. And it, this was presented by Jason Redgrave. Um, and the idea here is to accelerate uh, media processing using less energy per operation, but also high performance. Now at one end you've got the CPU, which is programmable, but um, energy inefficient. And then at the other end, you've got an ASIC, which is non-programmable, but has very high performance and very low power. And they wanted the um, the Pixel Visual Core to be somewhere in the middle. Now, it kind of sounds like a DSP, um, but the idea is that it's designed to be customizable. 
Now I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, they use a backend called Halide, so they can work with custom formats. Uh, they use a very long instruction word architecture, and it's all based around stencils and buffers. So when you work on an image, you work on one pixel, but that's based on the data of the pixels surrounding it in, in what's called a halo. Uh, and they were talking about the hardware resources, so the visual core, you know, it has an A53 in it that's over here with a, a memory controller, PCI bus. Um, these are the uh, processing units inside the core that do all the compute. And if you see, look, it's TSMC 20 nanometer, a fairly big chip. Um, what's that? Just over 42 square millimeters, 400 megahertz. It has uh, half a gig of DRAM uh, power under 4.5 watts. Well, I'd hope so um, for processing images. Uh, they didn't go into how, into, in what, like, way it works on the device this is purely a hardware talk um, and that's relatively interesting to go through and you know there's some q a so that was the first talk that we covered the uh, next one um, and so we don't cover all the talks of the day in the live blog just the ones i find interesting um, so this one is intel on graphics um, which sounds like it would be a super talk about the future of intel and graphics but no it's they ended up talking about uh, KBG uh, by a presenter who worked on AES, NI, and SSE, SSSE3 instructions. Now, you might think, oh, KBG, okay, that's boring. Uh, what they did here is go into more about the power, um, yeah, aim to bridge the divide between thin and light. But I think the important thing here was the fact that it was a multi-generational. It's This project is multi-generational. That Now, I wrote that with exclamation points thinking, okay, this confirms AMD is in uh, going to be in the next generation. The next generation. Um, that wasn't stated, so technically when Intel gets on its feet with the gen um, graphics, they could easily just swap it out with a gen graphics core. It depends on the arrangement with AMD. Um, they actually said that here, there's a framed version of the agreement with AMD at headquarters because these two massive, these two massive competitors are actually working together. So. There's that. And so the, yeah, the idea to enable VR and mobile form factor, um, these slides I've seen before, you know, graphics, they say nine displays can be supported from the whole chip, but even on their own device on the Nook, they only support six and you can't support, um, you know, the um, Blu-ray Ultra, uh, what do you call it, encoding, because there's no video outputs from, um, the integrated graphics, so you know, whatever they yes, you can do nine displays, but Intel doesn't even do it in their own device. The way they did the way they made KBG was through EMIB, um, or two technologies that require enable them to do it was EMIB and this dynamic platform thermal framework, um, which I'll go into. So, the whole point of the chip is that you have the CPU, the GPU, and the HBM, and the CPU and the GPU. Are just connected by PCIe through package, but the GPU and the HBM is connected by EMIB um, because EMIB is a low power, high bandwidth interface. And uh, the reason they gave it, the reason they gave they didn't do um, EMIB between a CPU and a GPU is because you don't need that amount of bandwidth between the two, and PCIe was just happy to go through the package. Um, I think it's because Intel hasn't got EMIB to work with two very power dense uh, chips yet working together because you have thermal cycling and you can just imagine a package buckling if it's, you know, you uh, have lot, very big thermal swings and very uh, big thermal differentials um, between two chips, that, two high power chips that close together. Uh, with a HBM stack, that's not as high powered as um, others, so that. Um, it's fully okay to put that next to get to a GPU, or they've done it with the Stratix 10 with the FPGAs. So EMIB works by, it's kind of like an interposer, but just a small interposer. The, down, the upside of it is you can get good density, uh, you can get for interconnect. Uh, it's supposedly the lower cost, though that's not entirely been demonstrated. And one of the issues, another issue is that um, for it to work, you have to have super small micro bumps on both dies. Whereas Interposer, you can use normal size bumps. The only issue is that the Interposer arguably costs more than the Silicon Bridge. Now, Intel originally put said EMIB 
uh, one of the benefits was the Z height. Yeah, however, we saw with uh, KBG and um, Vega Mobile, so KBG with the uh, EMIB and Vega Mobile with the Interpose, that they're both 1.7 millimeter Z height. So whatever benefits of the Z height seems to be nulled at this point. Um, so yeah, EMIB packaging, um, it works as, as you would expect. They're saying this was a logistical issue because um, they're essentially taking off the shelf and components so they can have minimal changes. They said the, the GPU, they had to have it reconfigured slightly for EMIB in terms of the uh, micro bumps, which as I just said, you know, you have to have smaller micro bumps to make EMIB to work, so that's fine. Um, they did say they had Z height challenges. Uh, the HBM2 is actually taller than the other components. So they had to get the memory vendor, uh, SK Hynix, I think, um, to actually thin the memory down at the top so they could have a fully flat, um, you know, to enable the, the heat sink to be able to be put on it. Um, so that was interesting. That was thinned. That's how they say custom. And then they have, you know, different testing facilities. They said, you know, just a logistical nightmare. And the second part was platform level power management. Um, I won't go through this, um, but essentially, you know, this is just taking advantage of thermal headroom by doing all the sensors. Um, Intel puts it in, it's up to the OEM to use it properly. How the OEM uses it is up to them. Um, and, uh, and this is um, talking about power designing for, you know, system design power, not thermal design power. Um, yeah, and there's some EMIB and uh, you can go read through that for or you can read our other content in EMIP. Uh, straight after Intel was AMD. AMD's talk was on APU optimizations. Um, this is fairly straightforward for anybody who's been keeping up with uh, AMD APU. This is just talking about their Raven Ridge, which is four Zen cores plus 11 compute units of Vega. Um, just saying how you know they improved a lot over Bristol Ridge because of new process, new technology. Um, more performance, uh, so they talk a little bit about Vega, a little bit about precision boost, um, how they can uh, shuttle power between CPU and GPU depending on the workload. Um, but the interesting thing about this talk was Infinity Fabric um, and how it works with the scalable data fabric um, interface modules between the transport layer and everything else. Um, and then, you know, different regions that can be turned on or off. Um, we have covered this before in previous talks, but this is a very nice representation and then keeping everything coherent, uh, coherent data pathways, but you can also use um, non-coherent data and that uh, takes a different priority. Interestingly, for, um, for, the, for the APUs, they're talking about um, the request classes in the Infinity Fabric. So you have hard real time, which is a, a display service refresh and audio because those, those need to be real real time otherwise people notice soft real time here they give an example of video playback it's okay if you m might miss a frame or something in video yes people notice it but it's not as bad as display not updating completely or audio cutting out they have non real time which is just you know normal cpu um, instructions you know just go as fast as you can but you're not the highest priority and within the priority, you have virtual queues um, and shared pool tokens, which is, you know, standard routing mechanisms and stuff. Uh, yeah, and then they're talking about how to improve the memory on Vega because you're only got access to DRAM. Um, so things like increasing caches helps with that. And then they said, hey, this scales. Um, new display and video codecs, uh, which we've known about before. And then power delivery, we've also covered this before how you have um, one input regulator and then each um, each uh, power plane has its own uh, load dropout uh, reg regulators to help manage the power. As a result, you get um, better current density. Uh, and also when you manage the power on and off states, that helps as well. Um, and then, you know, performance, Any like I say, anybody who's uh, read our APU stuff um, knows about that, but it's, it's worth a read. Um, interesting talk of the day, sort of, sort of more esoteric, is this uh, deep neural network SOC for IoT. Now it's called uh, SMIV. It was made by a team at Harvard. Um, and the idea is to make a deep neural network chip for IoT. Now IoT, Internet of Things, has a really odd set of requirements. 
you need it super low power, you need it um, to work as quickly as it needs to. Um, but because the world of artificial intelligence and neural networks is fast changing, IoTs are typically baked and set in products for 10, 20 years. Um, so you need something that's also partially configurable. However, if you have it partially configurable, it has the potential to use more power. So how do you make a neural network SOC that's also that's both configurable and lower power and will happily be there for 10, 20 years? Um, so this is their design using uh, Cortex A53s. They have an always on cluster that is um, super low power with based on Cortex M0. But if they need to fire everything else up, they can. It um, also has an embedded FPGA. So that's where the configurability comes in and um, enough memory on chip so it doesn't have to go off chip, which is, you know, which is power inefficient. Um, but obviously putting SRAMs on your chip uh, is diarrhea on cost. It's always a balance. Same with um, normal CPUs for desktop. And so they go through all the different parts of uh, their chip here. Um, and they said it was it was pretty quick. It was uh, nine months uh, to tape out. Um, they used industry standard tools and high level synthesis. They also had lots of scripting methodol methodologies because it's a research group that's been designing chips for a while. Um, you know, and they really were helped by ARM and their design start because uh, it was an academic, they can use um, academic licenses, uh, which is you know cheaper than companies doing it. Um, so yeah, examples of what you can do on the uh, the FPGA, you can do uh, neural networks and DMA engines. So one thing on their always on um, section is that they can do um, neural network uh, classification. So if they need to fire on the rest of the chip, they can. Um, but if they don't need to, they can do one inference uh, com computation in as low as 150 nanojoules. Um, yeah, which is super low power. Uh, so that was SMIV. Now the last three talks were straight one after another. Uh, NVIDIA talking about its Xavier SOC. Um, this is the one that they're pushing really hard into automotive, uh, into level four automotive, I believe. Um, and this was more just talk about the chip, most of which we've seen before. So this was, um, you know, eight custom ARM cores called Carmel cores. Then you have 512 um, CUDA cores of Volta. Um, you have a deep learning accelerator, a programmable vision accelerator, um, you know, DSPs or, and ISPs, image signal processor, and um, then multimedia accelerators. And it all uh, because it's automotive, it has to conform to standards. And it's they said, they said so the GPU in this and the accelerators that might be in other products, they actually optimize them here for energy efficiency. So it would look if you looked at a floor plan, it would probably look a little different how they've arranged stuff. Because um, uh, obviously they're not running the Volta GPU at um, you know over a gigahertz or almost at two gigahertz. So. Um, so 9 billion transistors, 350 square millimeters. Um, so the thing hit the the key part I think here is is actually this bottom one. So if you take the use case of um, autopilot, you know, you have to capture the image, process, perceive the image, track it, localization, planning. Uh, so this is all you know mapping where you are. So you have a mixture of image signal processing. Um, the uh, vision accelerator, then the deep learning accelerator for perceiving and then um, tracking. Again, you've got the vision accelerator. So all of this used to be uh, CPU, GPU stuff, and now you, you offload it to accelerators. Um, so have a have a look at that. And um, you know, comprehensive I/O subsystem, uh, Gen 4, PCIe, um, four displays, support 16 cameras, that sort of thing. Um, but so, so with these accelerators, uh, it gives you the number of tops that it can do deep learning operations. Um, and the idea is that if you're offload these accelerators, you're using much less power for either the same speed or better. Um, so you get your you know, higher frame rate. 
these aren't really in in um, power constrained environments, but I guess if you're sticking in an electric car, then you know every joule helps for range. Now the last two talks are based on security. So Microsoft Azure, which is their cloud platform, they actually have what's called Azure Sphere, um, which is uh, part of their secure platform. And the whole thing about Azure Sphere is microcontrollers. So microcontrollers everywhere. I mean, you've probably got at least two dozen in your smartphone. Um, but you know, sim small, simple IoT devices will have microcontrollers. Um, you know, why? And microcontrollers are cheap low cost, have reasonable performance for what they need. And now they're usually made on old fab processes like 65 nanometer or even 90 nanometer um, in old fabs. But now old fabs can do a bunch of stuff with connectivity like Wi-Fi and more memory. So these microcontrollers are getting almost as big as microprocessors, you know. So the point is they said 9 billion connected devices shipped in 2017 and you only need 100,000 devices, you know, to cripple a service. Um, so what this, so what Azure Sphere is, is um, a, an operating system that runs on the, mem um, the microcontroller for security and it connects in the cloud, it doesn't use passwords, it just uses um, secure certificates. Um, they use these, you know, these seven procedures saying all highly secure connected devices require seven properties, you know, root of trust, defense, um, uh, small um, attack surface, um, you know, uh, updatability, certificates, failure reporting, and renewable security. Um, so this is all based around uh, the Microsoft Pluton security subsystem. And the first uh, microcontroller, which is of this class, is work that they've done with MediaTek, built on 14 nanometer, is silicon in package. Um, it reduces its attack, better, attack surface in many ways, one of which is power, so 3.3 volts. Um, you know, and it has memory, caches, uh, Wi-Fi radio, processing, I.O. And um, you, you know, securely isolated subsystems uh, based on most of them on ARM Cortex, but you also have this um, uh, N9 32-bit risk core in the Wi-Fi. This is a basic microcontroller, so you know, single stream, 802.11n, the fact it's dual band is, is even surprising. Um, you know, and it has a different I.O. Um, I.O. through the same set of pins generally, you know, again reducing uh, the attack surface. It, um, so you have what's called an application process subsystem with, which, which just runs um, what it needs to, but then you have a security subsystem which runs on a Cortex M4, um, and it, you know it has um, e fuses to store data. Which you know the idea is it can't be probed. The moment somebody tries to um, take that data out or compromise it, it kind of fails and breaks the chip. That's you know it's a fuse. Um, so we go with the subsystem, and uh, these are all the features that uh, the, their MCU program has. Um, it says the internal OS is based on Linux, so it's not a Windows-based OS if you're thinking, well, it's Microsoft. Um, so, uh, lot, lots of questions here because it's security, obviously. Do you plan to open source the cores? Software, we open source. Hardware, we're royalty-based. Um, somebody asked, you know, who owns the root key? Um, so, say you've got it in a, say you've got this microcontroller in a, fr in a connected fridge. Um, Microsoft did not confirm that the user has the ability to deny updates because it's their product, essentially saying that um, the manufacturer is still in control, which is, you know, depends how you like security, whether you trust companies or not. Um, so uh, infrastructure exists today for these devices. Provisioning such certificates happens between the manufacturer and Microsoft. So you, as a user, you have to trust that the manufacturer and Microsoft um, are reliable, are trustworthy. Um, then there's some talk about physical attacks, um, multiple power domains, uh, infrastructure, and power consumption. Um, so yes, that was interesting. Go have a look if you want to read through that. 
Um, I should say that one thing I didn't uh, write up is there was a one hour talk uh, about um, spectrum meltdown, um, more sort of going across um, exactly what they are and, diff and different ways that the community has to readjust its mindset um, to do it. So that was a part of the discussion that I didn't, that was, um, that I didn't live blog. Uh, it wasn't hardware related so much, um, even though the issues are hardware related. Uh, so this is Google Titan. This is their. Um, this isn't a GPU. It's, probably, it's called Titan. It's their root of trust silicon that sits between the BIOS and the processor in, on its custom data center systems. And the whole thing is, is that they're making um, it practically open source. Um, but they went through their implementation of it. Um, so it's all about having silicon root of trust. Um, chip has requirements, and this is how they're implementing it between the boot and the chipset, um, and here they have it, say, installed on a NIC, um, so you can have it in, not only can it be used for the main system, it can be used for subsystems as well. Um, they made their own because they needed a chip that did all they wanted and they couldn't find one out there. Um, so things like uh, doing verified boot, but doing verified boot in a way that each stage verifies the next. So um, and but it's also double protected in flash so in case somebody tries to flash new firmware it cuts out um, the way they do their chip identity trust so one of the things that came up is well if somebody's making this do they trust say TSMC or Samsung or whoever whoever the foundry is um, not to mess with it so the chip actually creates its own public private key pair um, and it's a unique ID itself so that can't be messed around with the um, manufacturing um, and they track the life cycle through fuses uh, let's bring up the picture here so they have nine fuses so when it um, when it's made when it's on the way for all the fuses are active during the test it has two of these fuses you know destroyed so any chip that has those two fuses destroyed is considered manufacturing now a chip will either go into a development role or a production role, and then you have mutually exclusive fuses burned for that. And if it, if there's an issue about it, they can. Um, oh, so so if it's in production or development, um, the fuses that are burnt means that they it um, the chip is no longer configurable anymore. If they want to make it configurable again, you have to um, cut out the fuses. But that means it puts it into what they call an RMA mode. Um, so even if somebody did compromise it, they'd have to burn the fuses to enable configurability, but you couldn't cover up your tracks because, um, you know, these are one-time deals. And if, you know, it do, if, if any of the fuses uh, go wrong, or if, if it's discovered that there has been tampered with, um, you can use software to burn all the fuses and it just kills the chip. Um, so, you know, th this is data sense stuff. Um, and it goes through a bit here and you know all the different security countermeasures interesting one somebody asked um, you know how does your th temperature sensor work and they said well this chip is in a data center if you're at negative 40 degrees chances are somebody's trying to do something um, which I thought was fairly amusing and the whole point of this was you know moving to an open platform open ISAs using RTL repositories um, and they're Building a working group which won't see, it won't accept new members for until next year they said. Um, so power they said for this chip was 15 milliwatts. Um, let's see, uh, three clocks is work group public. Um, so yeah, that's that's their that's their route to trust. These people are really paranoid about security and to be honest you know you need this stuff to be over engineered uh, so th that was day one um like i say go um, read through these live blogs or andre's piece if you want to go through it um, all of our live blogs are now in our pipeline section so you have to um, go to the main site and then click pipeline stories um, that's a clickable link for anybody who didn't know and uh, pipeline is just our new section that's what we call our new section um, and they're all here and uh, you can read through. So, 
that is hot chips day one we will be he i will be here again tomorrow uh and there's about nine live blogs prepared including um uh, nvidia's nv switch there's a couple from xilinx there's um, a few neural network ones it, it's going to be interesting and um, i love this show it's great we learn so much um, so thank you for listening and I'll see you tomorrow.